It's a great privilege. She is not only truly inspiring, but a very warm person. She has been national spokesperson of BJP and a nationally well-known television debater before she took over as chairperson of the National Commission for Women. She is an experienced social worker who has worked on various development issues for women and underprivileged for over two decades. She is also the founder member and chairperson of Prakriti Trust, Indian Social Responsibility Network, and a trustee and chairman in Road Safety Trust. But above all, one of the most warm and committed person I have seen in public life. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and a very proud moment for us to welcome Ms. Lalita Kumar Mangala. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, I can't see any of your faces really clearly, which I wish I could. But I'm glad to see that there are also gentlemen present at this event. Um, uh, group. I must also admit that I'm also one of the fortunate ones in this country. I was born into a family, no, no, there was no need to put on the lights, it's fine. I was born into a family where I was never taught that because you're a girl, you can't do anything or get anywhere. It's a joke in the family that the girls are better educated than the boys. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was not so common. Today, I think it's becoming increasingly common that girls are more aggressive, more hardworking, uh, but unfortunately, when it comes to the workplace, they're not more inclusive. Uh, for decades, India has followed, I think almost sometimes blindly, the Western concept of women's empowerment and emancipation, where it's held up as a man versus woman uh, strife or struggle, but it isn't. Uh, especially in the last six months from what I have seen, Women are as much part of what is called patriarchy as men are. Women are as often guilty as men are of suppressing women or oppressing women or just treating them very badly all around. Women are as guilty of not being empathetic towards other women as men are. There is a change in this country. Not all men are rapists. Not all men are unfair to their sisters or wives or mothers. And the most surprising fact is, which I think maybe many of you already are aware about, is that it's not just the so-called poor classes or the lower classes where women are disempowered. The lowest rate of male-female children in Delhi is in South Delhi. That's not where you have the Jogi Jobris, or at least not too many of them. And this is a, is a fact that is probably will be borne out if you read any research about any part of the country and I think any part of the world too, wherever something like as gross and terrible as female feticide exists. I think that it's time we take the men on board, which is why I'm glad to see so many men here. And I came in a little late because I was caught in two traffic jams. Lutians Delhi, contrary to what most people think, has a lot of traffic jams nowadays. And um, I heard just the last 10 minutes or so of what the four or five gentlemen on stage were talking about. And I was very happy to hear that at least one of them is doing some child, what was the word you used? Babysitting. Because every woman who has had to babysit, at least in my generation, as I say, would have given an arm and a leg to have had a husband who says, okay, you go today to work, I'll manage, you know. Once in a way, if somebody had done it, I mean, I, I used to almost, order my husband and say, okay, now I've had enough. I'm either running off to my mother's house, you can keep the kids for a couple of days, or you better take some of the. Fortunately, I had a very tolerant husband, so he would tolerate my tantrums. But that's also because uh, there were many reasons that, um, you know, were to my advantage. In my generation, women were not generally empowered. We were not generally encouraged to become self-employed entrepreneurs. We were looked at, though we were, many of us were very highly educated, we were looked at more as, less as partners and more as competitors. Perhaps that is where sometimes the so-called women's movement faltered, where we forgot that, you know, we need to reach out. That's why networking is not just about within or without organizations. It's also to reach out to people who would empathize with you. Women don't need to network merely today with other women. You can network with men also, which is a very huge advantage from my generation to yours. I'm not yet that old, but my daughters sometimes say that I'm not quite fossilized, but getting there, they say. 
Anyway, what, what is the, the most welcome change is the change in thinking in this country. That glass ceilings are there to be broken, not merely to act as a barrier. That women and men can have relationships which are not based on sex. That women and men could be friends and colleagues without uh, unnecessary, let me say, unnecessary factors such as competition or sexual attraction or various other or petty politics being played. In fact, in my commission, I have just asked for, and I probably will be given, fortunately, a male member secretary. Uh, that is the person from the government who will be um, nominated from one of the other departments, who will be the main administrative head along with me. I'm the operational head. He will be the main administrative head. And I don't think there's going to be any problem in us working together. But this is a mindset that's only come over the last 10 or may have perhaps 15 years. Before that, it was uh, very clear that there are said, certain roles women play and certain roles men play and that men are normally the bosses. Today, there are many bosses who are being accepted by younger male colleagues and I'm very glad to see it. The friction that used to be there, all the sort of almost incipient, that okay, I mean, you're, you're a woman, so there are some things that you can't do. I'm, I'm always, you know, there to help you sort of, it's an almost unconscious, um, not aggressor, but unconscious superiority complex, let me say, that used to be there. Today that isn't, and that is a huge advantage. Now to come back to what inclusion is, I don't think I'm anybody to give anybody any lectures here. Most of you will know more uh, than me about it. But what I would like to say is that I have found that in many occasions, um, men seem to be more willing to accept that, yes, okay, I mean, you know, something wrong has happened or that I have been unfair. Let me try and change. Uh, there was this family from Bihar, a young girl who, uh, she actually wore spectacles. That's what became a problem with her sister-in-law. And when they came in for counseling to the National Commission of Women, uh, the boy worked in the Navy, so understandably he was a little afraid that if the girl complained, if his wife complained to his superior officer's wife, he'd be in a lot of trouble. The armed forces are very strict about certain things. And uh, eventually, it was all fine between the husband and wife. They were very young, uh, less than 30, both the uh, husband and wife. What happened was, this chap's sister, it was, I, I, I afterwards said that it was almost like one of these soap operas. This chap's sister turned around and tried to slap her in the National Commission of Women. So of course we complained and the police came running. So um, there it was not the mother-in-law or anybody like this. This was not even a sister. I think she was a cousin of the boys. And the father-in-law and the mother-in-law were extremely um, positive and very, very genuinely empathetic towards the daughter-in-law's problems. Because she didn't, actually the real point thing, she didn't want to have a baby immediately. She said, I'm educated, I want to work. I'm still young, I can have babies later. It was very strange to see that basically it was a woman, and a woman of her own generation, who was the most antagonistic towards her. Later on when we, the commission sat down to try and think about it, we realized that it was probably because the, the, the younger girl who had come to us with her problems, was be, had demanded and will probably be given an opportunity that was not given commonly to people from their state of society. They were, I would say, middle to lower middle class uh, family. But this girl had been educated and she was from some remote village in Bihar, the name of which I forget. But she was a very smart and very aggressive, very gung-ho young woman whom I found very impressive com considering the fact that she came from some Motihar district or some such thing. <coughs> What I'm trying to say is that women need to also be more empathetic towards other women. I've heard of very few cases where women mentor other women consciously. Flexi time, of course, is uh, now slowly being introduced in many companies, especially I'm told in the IT sector. I may be wrong, but from all the reports that I have got from various women across the country, Bangalore is probably the city where the best flexi working hours are offered. And you'll find that the participation of women in the IT sector is far higher than in any other sector in this country, including self-entrepreneurship. That is one. The second thing, of course, is that, of course, we are wives, mothers, sisters, etc. 
But even women, we ourselves need to think of ourselves first as human beings. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. You're a person, an individual in your own right. And any individual, and this is something else that I always say, that stand up and ask, make a noise. We are always in India afraid to make a big scene. Stand up and shout if necessary, if people are not listening to you. They may, you know, look around and give you a few odd looks. But the chances today are that you will be heard, that your voice will be heard. There are enough people from both, I mean, regardless of gender, caste, uh, politics, etc., etc., who are very happy to give somebody whom they think has any iota of competence a fighting chance. Because eventually this is what we are asking for, equal opportunity. Today, fortunately, the women's movement has moved far ahead and come so far ahead that equal opportunity is what we are asking for. Whether it's in, unfortunately, for the girls in Haryana and various parts of the country where they are not allowed to be born or they are burnt for dowry or various other, I, I'm only giving some of the more horrendous examples. But you also have examples where young girls have walked out saying, we're not going to marry somebody because they insist on dowry. And they have been celebrated. There are as many stories of quiet stories of, of celebration which are not really being reflected even in the media as there are stories of horror and tragedy. Let's look on the positive side. Uh, today in India, the glass is coming up to half, half full. Perhaps not quite there half yet, but it is getting there. And a lot of the credit goes to many of the men who have also stood by many women. One of the most famous women in business in India today is Chanda Kochar. And I don't think she'd be there where she is without the mentorship of the people, the males in her, the men in that bank who actually helped her and gave her a chance. And look where she is today. I think she's now one of the, one of the 500 most influential or 100 most influential, the only Indian women on that list. It just came out yesterday, the Forbes list is what I read. But we also need to acknowledge and be grateful to the many, many people, uh, both men and women, who have helped us to get where we are, all of us in this room, whether it's with regard to education, whether it's regard with access to finance, whether it's regard to, uh, uh, to, access, uh, to skilling. Access to finance is all very well, but when you don't have the skills to manage the money that you may inherit or you may be given in order to set up a business or run it, then you sometimes get into a lot of trouble. Now, I don't know how much time I've got left. There's a stopwatch there which is flickering and it's quite distracting. But like I said, I'm not here to give anybody any lectures. But what I would like to say is that I'm very glad to see that there are so many, and I think you are probably a microcosm of the, of the sheer number of women in this country who are now able to stand on their own feet. Remember one thing, all of you. This is a statistic that has come out and been made very clear to me in the last six months as chairperson of the NCW, that whether it's violence, any form of injustice or inequality against women decreases when women have a share in their marital property or in... A, to put it more bluntly, have at least part ownership in the roof over their heads. If you have a home of your own, then an enormous amount of whatever injustice may, may be meted out to you will decrease. So please invest, all of you have enough money, buy yourself a flat or a house or whatever it is at the earliest. Because one day when your daughter, your daughter-in-law, whatever, or you know, even a friend, whatever, I mean, some, uh, if you can, if it goes to some other woman, she too will have a far better chance at equality than many others, than too many who don't have, let me put it that way. When we talk about rape, etc., in this country, there's a figure that I'd like to put out. You know, per capita rate is much less in India than it is in the US and UK. Unfortunately, Indians, uh, we should be ashamed of rape taking place anywhere. No woman deserves to be raped. No, no person. Unfortunately, children are also, and that is often regardless of gender. Nobody deserves to be raped, and yes, we should be ashamed of the fact that there is too much of that going on. But there, it is a fallacy that India is the capital of rapes. Reporting is too often, like I said, about the more negative aspects of life. There are dozens of stories. There's one girl I can tell you about from Tamil Nadu. I come from that state, so perhaps I'm more familiar with the success stories from there. 
There's a young girl whose legs were blown off or cut off in an accident. And she today is so uh, motivated, I mean, is so empowered that she's a motivational speaker. I think she travels abroad much, of, much more often than I do. And does not ask for any form of special treatment or pity or sympathy or anything. In fact, the first time, first two times I met her, I didn't realize that she was a double amputee. It was only when I was told. And I, I, was, I was so impressed because um, I meet many, many, many people from across every walk of life. And I have met ever since I started work uh, in 91 with poor and marginalized women. Uh, because I started work in the HIV AIDS prevention field, I worked with a whole cross section of society in India, whether they were transgenders or gay, bisexual men and, and women, or poor women. I mean, a huge cross section. So I learned not to judge. So I stopped looking at a person very, you know, up and down to see, okay, what is this person about? I just missed the fact that this girl, Malvika, was an amputee and a double one. She was so. Um, such a confident, cheerful, successful, <coughs> forward-looking person. That that, I think, was the most, uh, was, the, was the best way in which her empowerment was manifested. Everybody in this room is, I'm sure, of a similar uh, nature. So I'm, like I said, uh, I don't have to explain what inclusion is. However, we are still lagging behind in many ways in inclusivity of women. Despite the recent government guidelines where registers, um, listed companies are supposed to have a woman on board. And now I think pretty punitive damages are going to be put on companies that don't have women on board. Uh, often the women who are brought onto boards of companies are not the ones who are really qualified to be there. They're more relatives. Okay, I'm not saying all daughters and, and uh, daughters-in-law are not uh, competent enough to be on the boards of companies. But more often than not, it's like what happened when we first brought in the Panchayati Raj, the uh, reservation in the Panchayati Raj. They were merely Namke Vasti names that were put hurriedly on, you know, made presidents, etc., or at the Panchayat level. Three generations later, it's very different. We have very, very aggressive Panchayati. Uh, panchayat leaders, not all of whom are uh, PhDs or, you know, professionally uh, can speak very good English. Many of them are from the villages, from the so-called backward castes and Dalit communities who have understood what their rights are about, but all of them have a, a fair degree of education. That has been very important. I would like to tell you all that we should all pay it forward. Every one of us have been, have been given opportunities that too many women in this country even today don't get, perhaps all over the world don't get. I was just at a, a conference where South Asian countries uh, were represented. And every country had the same stories to tell. Every woman there who was there to give, present a paper or talk about her experiences in her own life, they had a very common thread running. We all connected so fast because we had so much in common. So. I would say, please pay it forward. If you find a maidservant whose daughter is in trouble, help her out. Stand up and shout. Use your whatever clout you have. Uh, it will help. In every small or big way that you think, all of us have, I mean, are very comfortably off economically. Use some of that money, merely, not merely for ourselves and our friends and our networking, our children, etc., but also perhaps for people you may not know at all. Try and fund the education of a girl. Try and see what you can do to contribute to the skilling of people. Like I tell uh, a lot of people, you know, women like me and like most of us who are sitting in this room, we'd give an arm and a leg to have a really smart housekeeper, who, you know, who can look at the, 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 the buying of the dolls and the tails and seeing that my children go to school. Of course, mine are now old enough that I think I'll soon have a grandchild I'll have to, you know, who'll be going to school in another couple of years or so. But we really give, would have given a lot to have a woman who is, um, uh, whether you want to call them a housemaid or a house help, who is skilled enough to take over the small problems of oh, the phone is not working, the, you know, the, the, the AC just stripped, or the plug socket, my, what's happened to it, we don't know, why is the mixie not working, all these small things that take up such a lot of our time and have been such a headache to many of us. Today, perhaps, uh, things are a little easier. But I don't know really how much easier they are because I often hear the same stories from many young women today. Flexi hours is something that I'd request all of you to introduce in all your companies. It actually pays. 
And finally, I'd like to say that please stop thinking of ourselves, whether it's our skilling or our being mentored or our being just included as some sort of corporate social responsibility. Economic figures in this country show that women do almost 70% of the work across the board, not just agriculture. Agriculture is much more. And we own less than 12% of property. We are less than, uh, I think, less than 13%, 11% is point something percent is what we are in parliament and in legislative assemblies, it's even less than that. Today, women can actually state with a lot of truth and confidence, of course, that we contribute, we already do contribute, not merely as mothers and housewives and, you know, sisters, daughters-in-law, daughters, etc. We contribute as individuals. We contribute in business, we contribute in agriculture, we contribute actually in keeping the peace in this country. I have a friend, a friend, a very close friend, in Chennai who is one of the best known exponents of the Gita. And she is a very, um, uh, very sort of uh, carefully spoken person. She doesn't use words unnecessarily, etc. And we were one day at a dinner with a lot of friends and there was a lot of noise being made by both men and women about who's the better sex, who's the better gender, etc. And she just shut us all up when she turned around and told us that, you know, each one of us here, all of us are wives here who are sitting here with our various husbands. Each one of us is the one who keeps this relationship going. The day a woman decides that I've had enough, that's it. Normally nobody will be able to keep that relationship together. So remember that we are, we are gifted with almost an innate ability to keep our relationships on even keel and to keep them going. Play that for, play, uh, forward too, please. Because too often we forget our own value in our own eyes. Self-esteem is something that is often lacking in most women. You don't have to always be aggressive when you make a noise. You can make it in, in a much more, I have often find, found it much more effective to say something quietly and not always be making a noise. People listen because people understand that we also have a lot to contribute. Let's not forget that and let's be grateful for what the chances all of us have been given and try and make sure that we help at least a few others who could also get to where we are. Thank you.